Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, we are going to talk today about introduction to information risk management. Um, they say that owners and dogs look alike. And this is my dog that passed away five years ago. And you notice that he also doesn't have a lot of hair and has a lot of wrinkles. Uh, and he also wears glasses, so we are all, all similar. Um, this uh, presentation we're going to do today is actually based on materials of mine, of Rod Brennan from Siemens, and from Da Yoon Moon, which is one of our PhD students here, who is working on dissertation on CRMA, which you'll learn in a second what it is. Um, this course is actually a part of what we call our Certificate in Audit Analytics. And the Certificate in Audit Analytics is a part of our Master of Accountancy program, uh, of a Master of Accountancy program, which is a composite of 10 courses of which the student takes uh, four residential at Rutgers over a period of two months, and then the other six uh, as distance courses. And these four courses together could be optionals on the Macy program, or they can be taken not as a programmatic course at Rutgers, but taken as uh, part of what we call a certificate in audit analytics. It's, it's oriented to people at the level of audit managers in the big four, uh, but uh, these days there is a lot of interest on this course, this type of courses at internal audit departments. Um, it's really uh, oriented, the certificate is oriented for people to understand analytics and choose correctly where to use it and be able to use it, although it's not deeply mathematic to, comp to understand the math, math very in great detail uh, or development of the math. However, it's uh, uh, sufficient for uh, the student to understand well what analytics to use and be able to interpret results of the analytics and apply some computers to do some of the analytics. Uh, the, pro, the four courses, the two courses are courses on analytics itself. One course is this one that is a wider course looking at risk, looking at controls, and looking at uh, the implementation of computer audit uh, in the practice of audit. And finally, the last course is a course for that each one of the students will be personally guided by one of the faculty at Rutgers to develop a practical project, hopefully in their own firm. If that not happen, we'll find some data for, for the student to participate. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, seven items. We'll first talk a little bit about, uh, to get your attention to understanding, about some drastic risk. Then we're going to define information risk management. Then we're going to talk about risk management and internal control. Then about continuous auditing and continuous monitoring. Then enterprise risk management, risk analytics, and then what we call uh, continuous risk monitoring and assessment. The, there are things that happen to businesses that basically destroy the business. And uh, come of the, some of the recent examples is the example of Societe Generale, who finish up uh, with a loss of 4.9 uh, billion euros because of uh, rogue trader and what we, they call the London Rail at JP Morgan Chase in $6.7 billion. The Barings case, uh, the company actually went bankrupt because of the losses uh, due to these rogue traders. Uh, that's kind of an extreme risk, a trading risk for a trading type of company. Uh, other type of risk that also was dramatic was violation of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, this example here is an example out of Siemens. Siemens leading US world company uh, from Germany uh, basically was using resources to pay bribes for people to buy their equipment. And interestingly enough, that, part, that type of uh, activity was allowed under the old German code, and the German code changed, and it became illegal. 
and Siemens continue, continue bribing to get business. It was probably the largest penalty ever given uh, by regulatory authorities uh, uh, that was over a billion dollars. Actually, the aggregate fine, the U.S. and German authorities was $1.6 billion. Um, uh, the other consequence to this was basically uh, the CEO of uh, Siemens resigned and a uh, good part of top management was shuffled. Um, and so the, basically this is a risk of a bad type of controls and uh, fraudulent foreign payments. Uh, this is a new CEO of, of, of um, Siemens talking about their reaction after the crisis. Compliance as a part of corporate responsibility is first priority, is compliance with the laws. So let's talk a little bit about this whole idea of information risk management. Um, companies live in a world of risks of many dimensions. They have human resources risks, they have fraudulent risks, they have market fluctuation risks, they have many different types of, of risks. Now, we should call the, your attention uh, to this word risk itself. And uh, in statistical terms, basically a large variation on status quo. But if you interpret it that way, there is the positive risk too, as opposed to the negative risk, whereby you have some kind of environmental event, for example, which actually creates inordinate profits. Uh, but typically the literature focuses on risk as downsize, uh, negative type of events, and try to estimate uh, how to avoid these risks or how to manage when these events happen. And of course there are really two types of risks, some risks that I totally exogenous, meaning there are risks that uh, you really don't have any control over that. There is an increase in the price of fuel for an airline. Um, there is a social convolution in Saudi Arabia or in uh, wherever it, it could be. And there are things that you don't really have too much control over. Some of them might be predictable, other ones are not predictable. The tsunami in Japan uh, was not really pre very predictable, although uh, some dimensions of it could have been mitigated. Uh, then there is the whole set of risks that are of your own doing, which is the risks like, uh, for example, poor internal controls and the rogue traders losing a lot of money on you or stealing money from you. Um, now, the risks, as I said again, they can be compensated by large rewards, large rewards or large punishments. Now, another thing that hasn't been talked very much in the risk theory is this idea of risk arbitrage. Uh, risk arbitrage is the situation whereby markets haven't still understood very well the risks of a particular activity, either upside or downside risks. And pretty much every kind of, uh, uh, every kind of business success is a type of risk arbitrage because what happens is that markets haven't understood that uh, uh, that uh, tablets or or iPhones or etc cetera, etc cetera are something extremely valuable in the market. A lot of people would like to buy it, and so people that invested arbitrage took the risk of investing in this new technology, made a lot of money, and moving money between one activity and the other is basically taking advantage of risk arbitrage. Uh, but it's a little bit of a different type of concept than a financial arbitrage. Um, now, uh, this is the whole idea of generic idea of risk and informi information risk is a sub-entity of that. Um, and uh, I actually rather prefer is that information risk a very used word, very misnomered word. And I rather talk about the uh, risk of incorrect information. And actually this is the area that we are mostly interested. We're interested on businesses, their risk, and the way we measure it, and if that measurement is correct. Uh, 
and this uh, this uh, I, risk of incorrect information um, permeates risk management because any area that has risk and you're trying to measure, you could be measuring it incorrectly uh, and there would be consequences for that measurement or maybe not being able to deal. Now, the big four firms tend to tend to call IRM departments, IRM departments, what in the old days were the computer audit departments. Today they probably do more, they consult more in the risk side, but they still are the main source of computer support for the engagements. And we should kind of separate uh, computer audit, direct work from uh, what we call information risk management, although computer audit is a method of information risk mitigation or detection. Uh, this, slides, this slide actually comes from, uh, uh, from the work of Rod Brennan and it basically points out um, the relationship or the natural fit between risk management and internal control. Very intuitively, uh, an effective internal control system reduces, mitigates key risks and any deficiency identifying impact risk identification. That's the first arrow. The second one, identified risk can be highlight gaps in internal controls and influence identification of key control requirements. And so you, you need to think a little bit about what uh, the concept of, of control is and uh, how does it decrease your risk. Um, if there is a risk that there is absolutely nothing that you can do about, um, the only thing that, uh, the only action you can take is to report that risk and as a consequence, there will be consequences in your stock if you're a publicly traded company and etc. However, there are many, many activities whereby you can take mitigating measures to reduce the effect of an adverse risk event or take substantive profit of the positive risk event. And uh, management entails understanding risk and being able to deal with risk reasonably well. Um, uh, Rod here talks about four types of uh, enterprise risk management and at four levels, at the strategic level, at the operational level, at the financial level, and the compliance level. Compliance is basically obedience to rules. Uh, financial, you know what it is. Operations and, and strategic, I think you, you, you should understand it is. And there are some good examples here. Um, for example, in strategic, corporate governments, the performance of the GORE, Bo uh, the board, the tone of the cult, uh, the tone and top culture, accountability, leadership, uh, certain controls and authority, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Now, in operations, it's actually more direct what the company is doing. Uh, the operation area is the area that is the most uh, profitable to actually have direct measurements of risk. And. At the same time, in financial area, you can have great measurements of risk. In the area of compliance, it's a little bit more complex to, to meet uh, these operations. These four two slides here, uh, you're going to be further discussed on Rod's course. This is also a Rod slide, and this slide actually, he picked it up from the corporate board. And the corporate board, he, they listed the 10 top risks. And this is actually, a cool picture because the red one is something that happened very fast, uh, the yellow one happened so, so fast, and the uh, green one ha happened slowly. And if you look at this, the, how likely that a particular event is going to happen and how high will be the impact. And interestingly enough, fraud is slow. is low likelihood and has a low impact. Personnel, personnel talent risks, 
they are likely to happen and have a high impact. Increase of competitive pressure has have a high likelihood, uh, but is kind of medium medium impact because you can remediate it. So if you look at these things as factors, uh, fraud, merchant and acquisition risk, uh, recessionary pressure, inflation, cost reduction, increased competitive pressure, commodity prices, liquidity risk, political trends, talent risk. This is an aggregate number and uh, it just come out from a survey uh, this. There is an interesting quote here from a professor from Harvard. He said, the most effective uh, approach to identify risk and opportunities for organization is to understand and plan for foreseeable trend surprises that will occur, but not try to anticipate that timing. It's, uh, it's uh, something that uh, we have learned also in our experience and our work is that figuring out what's going to happen most of the time is reasonably easy, is doable. But figuring out when it's going to happen is very, very complicated. We have worked on, uh, on this uh, standard of um, electronic reporting called XPRL, and everyone, not us, but everyone in the community was expecting the thing to be implemented in two or three years. We are 12 years into the cycle and is still in the progressive implementation stage. We thought it was going to take more, much more time because we realized the social technical systems are very slow in the adoption of, uh, of change. Um, I, I picked this, uh, this particular slide out of, uh, of Mr. Moon's slides and this is amplification of risk. Uh, in the US. The risk of outsourcing uh, our in-house IT function result in security issues and disruption of critical IT service. The risk that competitive accusation of grief washing, even if confirmable, will result in FTC charges. The risk that conflict minerals procurement result in med media reputation risk. The risk of emerging issues, etc., etc. Just to give you a little feeling of things that can be uh, quantified as risks and uh, can be qualified as risk and, and the wide range that this happens. Uh, if you look at the 10K of a company, they are required to list the types of risks that they have, that they anticipate to happen and their impact. Uh, but if you read those 10Ks, uh, those listings of risk, I don't find them very, very useful. And uh, not a lot of people have done a lot of research about it. Now let's talk about this area that we call continuous audit and continuous monitor. The first thing around this is uh, try to understand why we go in this direction of an acceleration of processes. You go to the direction of acceleration of verification and the monitoring of events because we are in this real-time economy and in this real-time economy um, you gain tremendous uh, economies in occupation of capital by performing continuous monitoring and taking rapid management actions. Uh, the definition, the story of continuous auditing uh, is uh, the first recorded application was at at and Bell Laboratories in f f the period from 86 to 91. A 91 uh, academic paper was published. In between the CICA, uh, in, in between afterwards, in about 10 years, the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants and the ICPA came out with what they call the Red Book. And the Red Book was kind of the first statutory guidance suggested for this area of faster audit. And the definition they use there is continuous auditing is a type of auditing which produces audit results simultaneous with over a short period of time after the occurrence of relevant events. These days when we talk about continuous auditing, we tend to focus uh, much in audit analytics and focus much in audit automation because obviously people do things in minutes and hours, computers do things in million nanoseconds and so if you really want to be close to the event you have to automate the processes. Um, the Institute of Internal Auditors, IIA, defines continuous audit simply as any method used to perform audit-related activities on a more continuous or continual basis. 
And uh, I actually like that definition a little bit better. Um, computer systems, support systems of organizations have their own pulse. And each application, uh, the speed of the assurance f function uh, depends on the uh, nature of the system. Uh, the, on that application of AT&T that I mentioned to you, the, the telephone switch actually only downloads data once an hour. You can't touch any data inside of the switch. So you can't do anything in, in the total continuum mode, but after an hour, every hour, you can ve do some verification. However, the billing works on 20 cycles per 30 days. So that's also pretty natural to do it 20 times uh, a day. These days, 20 times a month. These days, uh, banking activities uh, occur on a continuous basis. There are a substantive uh, level of updating that happens uh, during the day. So you can go into a terminal and see your balance as at that moment. However, much of the processing is overnight. So a lot of the controls and, uh, and uh, auditing of, of bank computer systems should be done on a daily basis, not on an hourly or minute basis. However, there are certain things that uh, is probably worthwhile doing on a real-time basis. Um, uh, since, the f since the first guidelines of issued by the Institute, the CIC and the ICPA, both the IIA and, and ISACA issued guidances in continuous auditing. And the IIA is just at the stage of reissuing its guidance and amending some of the guidance they have. And the AICPA is creating another version of the Red Book. Uh, just tell you a little bit of history. And uh, then differentiate, let's differentiate a little bit continuous auditing from continuous monitoring. The first part of the story is what I call the real-time economy. These are some of the key facilitating technologies that are creating the real-time economy. First, automation of many processes. Second, this idea of sensing or censoring uh, transactions. What does that mean? Is not entering with a keyboard the transaction, but automatically collecting the existence of the transaction. The third thing that has helped tremendously uh, the evolution of uh, electronic systems that are close to real time is the advent of these things we call enterprise resource planning system, ERPs. And these systems basically are integrated man uh, management software to run the business. They typically have one database in the middle and a whole set of different applications around it. And uh, they tend to claim that these applications are best of practice. So if a company picks up uh, ERP like SAP and SAP virtual manufacturing, they will be trying to use, they'll be using best in practice manufacturing uh, computing support systems. Uh, the large vendors in the ERP area are basically SAP and Oracle with Microsoft acquiring several small vendors of accounting software and competing with, with the dynamic product. Um, the reason why ERPs are such an important thing in this continuing audit framework is that they bring all the data of a corporation into a common platform, or at least for, for a sub-corporation, et cetera. And finally, the fact that e-commerce is evolving and evolving rapidly makes that many of the sales transactions are automatically corrected. And the moment the sales transaction happened is already recorded and can be dealt with. I mentioned earlier the application of uh, uh, the first recorded application of continuous audit. This was at AT&T. And uh, in, by and large, what that application was, was monitoring carefully uh, a large billing system, which you know, now we, we call it uh, CMR, CRM, Customer Relationship Management. And uh, when that exceptions occurred, um, creating alerts to management and to auditor. Uh, that's something that we need to talk a little bit more about. And the first, uh, so what I described is that you would collect 
key information about the billing system, would compare with a standard, and if things anomaly happened, you would create an alert. So what, what did you need? You needed basically two things and a couple of models. One thing, you needed a measurement of the system. The second thing, what did you need? The model to compare the measurements against. The third thing, you needed an uh, acceptable variance model, a model that would tell you that above what level of variance you would have to create an alarm. Actually, de facto, what we did there is we created four levels of alarm, and in the first level of alarm, we just alerted the auditors. The second level of alarm, we alerted auditors and management. Um, the third level of, of alarm, we, uh, we took it to top management, and the fourth level of alarm, before even taking to top management, we stopped the process because a big crisis was happening. We called that continuous audit, and that was that um, basically generated the red book and ensuing work. After that, uh, around the early 2000, uh, we got a call actually from Rod Brennan from Siemens, and they said he said that he started discussing the issues around uh, around uh, auditing. The, very, the many SAP systems that Siemens America had. And he said, well, you know, we are performing uh, audits every 18 to 24 months. We have over 100 ERP systems. And uh, we need to kind of find a better way to do this, a uh, more interesting, more intelligent way to do this. And so we finish up with uh, an application that basically compared control baseline of an ERP system against uh, a, a, control, a control structure of an ERP system uh, against its, a baseline. And what does that mean? That means that a certain number of controls are deterministic, mean that there should be a P, and if it's not a P, it's good or it's bad. Or if you have several P's, it's a problem too because you can't have so many super users and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they were just a, set, a group of controls that needed to be verified that had actually uh, this problem of having been reconfigured. And this is a generic thing on large ERPs, is that most controls, many controls are reconfigurable. So the user can change the limits, can change the configuration of controls. And there was a need to monitor and controls. So we decided that we actually taught this control monitoring and alerts of when there is a variance on controls was also part of continuous auditing. So we finish up renaming, calling continuous auditing was the two approaches, and we actually called the first one continuous data audit, the second one continuous control monitor. This was around 2003, 2004. Since that time, they typically call continuous control monitoring CCM, and there are products out there. Uh, for example, ACL has a product on CCM, and many companies have been purchasing the product. Uh, more recently, after the financial crisis, recent, we started, there has been tremendous emphasis on what they call uh, risk-based audits. And the idea would be that you audit less the things that are less risky. And we felt that, uh, uh, we felt that there was a need for actually risk monitoring and starting to think about uh, how to react to risks. Um, it's worth mentioning that we have these different concepts here. One concept of continuous monitoring, and what is the concept of continuous monitoring? Is a concept of comparing a standard with an actual in operations. That doesn't come to the point of audit. It's just monitoring operations. And uh, Jim Littley from KPMG usually says that a great differentiator of what is continuous audit and what is continuous monitoring is that continuous audit, uh, continuous monitoring is performed by management, continuous audit is performed by auditors. But uh, if you look at this carefully, there is a substantial overlap and you really can't do a continuous audit without monitoring. But if management uses the monitoring results, that's uh, continuous monitoring. 
If man manager doesn't use it, auditing just picks it up and does the assurance function on it, maybe a real-time assurance function, then you have a situation of continuous audit. So if you only looking at operations and looking at variances and interfering in the process to improve the process, you are doing continuous monitoring. If you're also using flows of data of that type to assure the data, to understand variances on the data, to understand where it's acceptable, not acceptable, and to issue opinions on this, then you are doing continuous audit. The difference is tenuous, uh, and companies will define the difference in different, in different ways. Modern systems typically have some kind of method of comparing actuals uh, with models. And uh, systems today have many elements around it. Some elements which we call the legacy systems, old computer systems that haven't still been implemented as, uh, uh, that haven't still been implemented as, uh, um, as uh, part of ERP. I typically have ERPs, and I typically say that large companies Large companies don't have one ERP. They have many different types of ERPs. Uh, some of these ERPs, uh, like for example Siemens, largest German company, largest client in the world of SAP, uh, but they actually, in the US, they have JD Edwards as part of, of, uh, as part of, of their information systems. Why? Because they have acquired subsidiaries that had JD adders there, and it's too expensive to change. So there's, there is this whole set of ERPs linked, and then you use, you create, uh, uh, you create middleware in between, and in addition to that, many companies have some kind of competitive uh, uh, client-facing web systems to basically deal with their clients. All of these generate a whole set of reports. These reports are to be compared in models, and when there is substantive variances, you create exception reports and you take alarm type of actions. Um, now, I just for a second, talk about the, the research that we have been doing here at the Car Lab. And uh, you, we already talked about what is a CDA, what is CCM, and this terminology CRMA. And we have done quite a lot of research in continuous data audit. We have done some in CCM. We wrote a case. We, we did this work with Siemens that basically started the, the motion. And now we are just starting to do work in CRMA. And we are going to talk a little bit more about what we think the CRMA is going to be. This is just a decoration picture there of uh, showing you who my friends are. Okay. See, his eyes are here. And uh, for the haircut, you will notice that is me. Okay. And uh, this, these are hammerheads, and uh, when you're diving in an island in, called Coco's Island in Costa Rica, uh, you have a lot of these guys around you, but they, they don't seem to be very harmful, at least to, to, uh, to what they were not very harmful. So I'm going to now show you a couple of the slides of Ron Bernan uh, about uh, defining ERM. So what is risk management? Risk management is identification, assessment, and prioritization of risks followed by coordinated economic application resources, minimize, monitor, and control the probability and impact on fortunate event, or to maximize the realization of opportunities. This is a long definition. Um, this is actually part of ISO 31000. ISO is an uh, international standards organization, and they have standards for a lot of different things. This ca can come from uncertainty in financial markets, project failures, uh, legal liabilities, credit risk, accidents, etc. As we said, we have risks in many, many dimensions. Uh, and there are risks, standards developed by the Project Management Institute and National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, another organization uh, called COSO, the Committee of Sponsor Organizations, have developed a uh, framework to deal with ERM. And the framework is a three-dimensional thing uh, with first dealing with levels, strategic operations, reporting, and compliance. The other level 
which is the internal environment, objective setting, identification, risk assessment, risk response, control activities, information communication, monitoring. And then this is the level of business, uh, subsidiary, business unit, division, entity level. Now, this is, uh, there is a new version of COSO uh, coming out, um, and uh, they, uh, they keep improving the area of COSO. Around this, uh, around this structure, they have an internal control framework that they have developed, uh, which is kind of similar. I, I, I find organizations try to copy or apply COSO, but COSO is a very wide type of standard, and of course is I think the best we have around, but it's difficult to, you have to basically implement and operationalize many of the measures that you are, that you're talking about. Uh, it's probably worthwhile talking about the King Report. The King Report is actually South African report that tries to deal with this issue. So it divides, the, the report has basically nine chapters, and one of the chapters focuses on the governance of risk. Uh, and, and as a detail, the 10 principles of risk is the board should be responsible of the government risk, the board should determine the risk of levels of tolerance, the risk committee or the committee should assist the board in carrying out risk responsibilities, the board should delegate to management the responsibility to design, implement, and monitor, so based the board, is management who does it, the board should ensure that risk assessment perform continual base, the board should ensure that Frameworks methods are implemented to increase the probability of anticipating unpredictable risk. The board should ensure that management considers and implements appropriate risk responses. The board should ensure continual risk monitoring by management. The board should receive assurance regarding the effectiveness of risk management. The board should ensure that there are processes in, in place enabling complete, timely, relevant, accurate, and accessible risk disclosures to stakeholders. This is a mouthful, and if you look at this, this is really a wish list. Uh, there is very little risk monitoring by management this day, certainly not continuous risk monitoring. There is a big gulf between what board wants and what management actually does. But actually, the, I think the King Report is, is a better set of principles to use than uh, COSO, which is very vague. Um, the ICPA has a task force working under the Sugar Surface Executive Committee, trying to say that, you know, if ERM is very, very important, and what we need to do is uh, potentially come up with a verification method if ERM is performed, being performed accurately. Uh, and so that's the idea behind trying to think about auditing uh, the risk management. So, so this is a meta-meta function. Uh, risk management is a quite meta function there to begin with, I mean a high level function, and assuring that this thing is being performed is even, even a higher, uh, higher level of, uh, of uh, extrapolation. Um, now let's talk a little bit about managing risk. Uh, Methodos definition goes that I uh, widely according to whether risk management matters in the context of process management, security engineering, industrial process financial portfolio, et cetera, et cetera. So project management, security, engineering, industrial processes, financial portfolios, actuary assessment, public health uh, and safety. The strategies to manage risk typically include transferring the risk to another party, avoiding the risk, reducing negative or effect or probability of the risk, or even accepting some or all the potential or actual consequences of particular risk. What does it mean accepting uh, some or all of the potential actual consequences of particular risk? Means that I'm going to live with this risk because it might be too expensive to do anything about it. Uh, and just understand that it, it could happen and that's it. Now, these are risks that you, that you manage to manage or at least you perceive. Uh, there is this thing that we call the black swan risks that are the risks that you're not totally, you never thought it would occur 
or you never thought about it too much. Now, um, as they say, if you can't measure it, you can't ma manage it. And so uh, it's necessary to come up with some kind of measurement of the risk that you have. Some measurements can be quantitative. Some of the measurements are only quali qualitative. Um, and typically you use this thing um, in business, this thing that we call key performance indicators. They are measurements of business that are good predictors or that predict a certain part of business. And associated to that, you use this idea that we have here of key risk indicators. Also, measurements that give you an idea of the risk level that you are being exposed to. Auditors understand the risk factors, the entities, major business activity, which might cause a failure to achieve their objectives. And then develop quantifiable KRIs that would indicate the presence of these identified risk factors. KRIs may represent the risk exposure of a particular business activity, for example, start turnover, uh, data capture errors, virus, or phishing attacks. Uh, KRIs provide an early warning to identify the risk areas that may harm the organizations. Um, the KRIs of the, of the entity's major business activity, we say here, are continuous computer, now should be continuous computer, monitored to indicate unfavorable trends, presence of significant risk. The values of its indicators exceed threshold in major Z given activity exposed to risk. This is basically that same discussion we had. There is a standard of risk, there is an actual of risk. If you can measure the actual risk, you compare the two, and then you decide where do you need to take action. The idea of continuous analytic monitoring module collects necessary data, computes KRIs, and measures the risk level based on the assessed level of KRIs. Okay, and just want to give you some examples. You know, this is getting a little bit theoretical here, so I want to give you a few examples of what we are talking here. Um, risk effort, employees' lack of adequate risks. So the KRI, ratio of collectors to supervisors. The average number of years of working experience. Collectors' performance is all about collectors. Ineffective collection uh, strategies, the ratio of money recovered to delinquent amount, to delinquent amount. Net margin ratio, credit loss, ratio of delinquent amounts. Inaccurate behavior scoring modules predict likelihood of collection. The, the variation of the profile of current applicants from the one used to develop uh, the sample po population stability index, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now that was kind of a brief introduction to, to the idea of risk and uh, just kind of recapping the the key features that we talked about risk. The first thing that we talked about is this idea that uh, a risk could be a positive or a negative thing, and uh, that uh, it determines many things that happen in a company. The second concept we talked about it was basically this idea of risk arbitrage, whereby you will uh, perform actions that take advantage of unrecognized risk. The third thing we said is that there are risks, there are all kinds of environmental risks and operational risk and strategic risk and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you're going to try to manage the business within that particular environment. So continuing back to this, the idea is that we would be monitoring a certain set of risks, monitoring a certain set of risks and uh, that are part of process risk, environmental risk, black swan risks. Uh, these risks would have the same kind of thing as continuous data audit has. There would be a standard that you would compare with it. If it exceeded the, the, cha the change to risk exceeded substantially the standard, you would call an exception and you would deal with that exception. Probably there would be also a procedure to just understand variances that are acceptable but might be uh, affecting. The other thing that would be probably pretty difficult analytically to do, but interesting to do, would be trying to understand, as we talked about, the covariances of risk or compound risk type of factors. Uh, probably that's a other type 
or other type of research. Um, so what we are basically saying is that what we call CRMA uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a development of a methodology to continuous monitor the entity's business risk profile, link it to material misstatement risk, and prioritize the audit procedures to focus on the high audit risk areas in continuous manner. The proposed methodology takes continuous audit approach and consists in three processes, monitoring the entity's business risk, linking the assessed business risk level to material misstatements risk, prioritizing audit procedures, focusing on the assessed high audit risk areas. Uh, the proposed risk assessment and audit planning methodology has the following components, risk identification, risk measurement, linking business risk to material misstatements, audit procedure prioritization. And these areas we already discussed, uh, this area of risk identification, which is probably the most serious of the areas, um, you, you achieve them by a series of business activities. And the term business risk is commonly defined as threats to entity achievements and objectives. Uh, one thing to be pointed out, the fact is that risk is not necessarily uh, a homogeneous factor. It's actually a whole set of sub-activities that the business perform, and each one has its own risk profiles. And some of the risks are integrators, so all the risks are separate. For example, if you have a, a major downturn in the U.S. economy uh, and you have two different activities, it probably is likely that both activities will lose business because uh, there is less money around to spend. Uh, so this is just an example of correlated type of activities. And the other thing is that it's quite possible that many risks are totally disjoint. One doesn't have an, anything to do with the other. Maybe the market demand is good but your workforce is poorly trained. Or your workforce in one factory is good, the other factory is poorly trained, or you don't have enough capital resources, or et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you have to basically understand that risks are basically a hierarchy of risks, and uh, some of them interrelated, some of them independent. Uh, prioritizing audit procedures. Remember, we are going to the four items there. Based on the assessed risk of material misstatement for each business process, audit procedures are prioritized in order that they are relevant to the high risk of material misstatements at business process level. And uh, in exchange to the traditional method, you now go to this following process. Understand the entity's critical business activities, identify the risk factors, determine indicators that represent identify risk factors, compute risk indexes, and then you create an expectation model, and then you do uh, the process at the, the RMM, at the business process level, and then you change the audit procedures. Thank you very much, and now I have a little bit more sharks here for you to see, uh, because this area of risk management, each one of these guys is a risk, correct? Thank you very much.